morning, everyone. Recording Thank in you progress. for joining us this morning. Just a few administrative points before we start. Um, we will be recording today's web, web webcast, and there will be a replay available on our website later on this afternoon. All attendees are in listening only mode for the duration of the webcast this morning, but we will be hosting a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. So you can use um, the Q&A button on your screen to submit any questions, and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Alternatively, if you're dialing in, you can send any questions you have to social media at elbowpetro.com, and we will also get to those questions. And lastly, just a friendly reminder that we do go through various non-GAAP measures throughout this presentation, as well as make um, various forward-looking statements. So please review all of the um, cautionary statements and other disclosures that you can find at the end of our presentation um, that's posted on our website. Thank you, Allison. <clears throat> so just to uh, start with production here. So since we came on production from our uh, cabaret project on July 5th of 2020, uh, I think we've posted some pretty good results here. Just a reminder, our first couple of quarters, uh, we came on production roughly uh, at our pre-commercialization uh, expectation levels, which were uh, equal to our firm volumes within our Bahia gas contract and also equal to our share of, of unit, uh, um, our working interest share of unit production. Uh, for several quarters after that, um, our partner wasn't nominating for gas and we were able to sell all that excess to, to Bahia gas on a flexible or interruptible basis. So you saw some pretty significant production increases through this period of time. We also expanded our, our, uh, um, our gas plant, our gas processing facility in the third quarter of 22, uh, of 2022, uh, and had an increase there as well. And then in the, in the second quarter of last year, our partners started nominating for more gas. And we also saw, uh, some demand impacts in the state of Bahia that resulted in lower, uh, nominations from Bahia Gas than what we had seen previously. So uh, we went through this period of time. And then last month, as we announced yesterday, uh, we had a nice increase in, in the month of July. Um, we agreed to review the pricing on just our flexible volumes within our contract on a monthly basis. And the result was a 49% increase when you compare that to the 1,629 barrels of oil equivalent that we produced in the second quarter. Uh, to the 2,432 barrels of oil equivalent that we produced uh, um, and sold in, in the month of, of July. So our strategy continues to be adding more 100% working interest production from our Murica 2.2 project. I think we've got some exciting results um, that we should be announcing here over the coming month, and then Adrian will walk uh, through, through that with you later in the presentation. But our objective is to be at our, our, our uh, with the addition of, of some of those volumes, to be approaching our, our near-term 3,000 barrel of oil uh, equivalent per day goal. Um, we talked about the redetermination on our last call. I think uh, one or two days after that, we announced uh, up, um, uh, the result of our emergency arbitration proceeding as well. So just a recap for people, though, um, we did have a positive result as a result of the uh, redetermination process. Uh, it became effective on June 1st with our interest, uh, working interest in the unit increasing to just over 56%. And the transition of unit operatorship uh, to Albo Petro is also underway. Um, we have previously advised that our partners disputing that. Like I said, right after our last call, we announced that we got a, an emergency arbitration order that grants the interim effectiveness of the expert decision until a long form arbitration can can be completed. So, um, and our, to be clear, our UA does dictate that expert decisions uh, and this redetermination process, uh, such as this redetermination process, is to be binding. Um, so we also, uh, in our release yesterday, announced our latest semi-annual price uh, update under our gas sales agreement. Uh, just a reminder how this works, um, we've got a long-term gas sales agreement with Bahia Gas, the prices are calculated based on three international benchmark prices. So you can see them in the various gray dash lines. Uh, this low one is, is U.S. Henry Hub gas prices. 
this upper one is is UK NBP gas prices, and the middle one that you see here is uh, Brent oil equivalent um, uh, prices. So you blend those together, average them over a period of time, and it calculates Elbow Petro's price in the black. You can see we've been roughly at the ceiling. We do have a ceiling and a floor within the contract, which is the green and the red. Both of those escalate based on U.S. inflation. Um, so we just announced our latest uh, reset here. On a Brazilian REI basis, um, the price was virtually unchanged from, from the last price that we saw. But because we have had some devaluation of the Brazilian currency, uh, we did see a U.S. dollar denominated a slight decrease in our price uh, to just under U.S. $11 per MCF. Um, and you can see we're just slightly below the uh, ceiling price within our contract. And then if we use the forward strip or, or forward uh, curves in the market as of yesterday, um, which is to the right of this line for each of those three different benchmark prices, you see the calculated price um, uh, that's just uh, slightly below our ceiling here for the duration of this chart that you see. So, so just jumping into the results that we released yesterday, starting off with our operating net back, um, that is one of the non-GAAP measures that that we look to that is um, basically our operating profitability per we expressed in barrel of oil equivalent. And just as a reminder, we compute that. It's the realized sales price. Those are the numbers at the very um, top of the stacking bar chart. And we deduct off royalties in orange and production expenses in the gray bar. And that gets us um, the, the operating net back, which is the green bar there. So. Um, in the second quarter, we did see a reduction in our realized sales price down to just below $72 per, per BOE. Um, that was mainly due to a re reduction in our effective U.S. dollar realized price on our natural gas sales. Um, that went from $12.57 per MCF in the first quarter to $11.83 in the, in the second quarter. Um, royalties were relatively consistent this quarter with last quarter, um, effective royalty rate of about 2.7% on our realized price. Just as a reminder, our, our um, statutory royalty rate in Brazil is between 5.5% and, and 11%, but with um, royalties on natural gas, it's based on more of a raw on, unprocessed value of that natural gas. So. Um, it's closer to a Henry Hub equivalent that the royalties get paid on, so that results in a lower effective rate. And then on the production expenses side, we did have a uh, reduction in volumes this quarter, and a lot of our um, operating expenses are fixed in nature, but despite that, we did have a reduction of um, over $2 per BOE compared to last quarter. It was about 351000 um, lower than Q1, and that was mainly due to some historical tax credits that we were able to get this in, in Q2 to recognize in Q2. Um, so overall, that reduced our operating expenses this quarter and resulted in a in lower cost per BOE. And um, that gave us a net back of $64.30 for the quarter. Um, it's down about 186 um, from last quarter, again, that's mostly due to the to the pricing. Still relative to our realized price, we're looking at a margin of 89%. And, you know, we went through this in past quarters. That's really, you know, top tier operating net box when you compare it to other South American um, companies or companies operating in Canada and the U.S. And when we layer into that, you know, we have a nice tax incentive in Brazil that really reduces our tax rate to about 15%, so our, that helps us generate significant funds flow, even in periods like this quarter where our production was down about 4% from last quarter. So moving on to funds flow. Um, so again, this is one of the non-GAAP measures that we look at, and it's basically um, cash flow from operating activities, but um, before um, changes in working capital. So we did see about a $600,000 decrease in our funds flow compared to Q compared to Q1. Um, most of that was due to the lower sales volumes and lower realized prices. Um, GNA was a little bit higher, uh, and then offsetting that was that lower production expenses that I referred to and lower current tax. And so we ended the quarter with um, funds flow of 7.9 million. 
On the net income side, uh, similarly, that was impacted as well by lower operating net back with the lower pricing and lower sales volumes in the period. Um, but the biggest significant adjustment here on net income was foreign exchange losses. So um, any of the U.S. dollar denominated um, liabilities of our Brazilian subsidiary, those result in a foreign exchange on foreign exchange loss on the local books that gets picked up um, on our U.S. dollar statements. So we did see with the devaluation of the Brazilian rail in um, from March 31st to June 30th. Uh, increased uh, losses in, in our Brazilian subsidiary on that. So foreign exchange losses were the biggest contributor there in that 2.2 million um, reduction in net income. Partially offsetting that was uh, lower current tax, which I already mentioned, and then also lower deferred tax and uh, depletion and depreciation. On the balance sheet side, we continue to have a very strong balance sheet. Um, we just as a reminder, we are debt free. We repaid our um, credit facility back in September of 2022. It was fully repaid. Um, and so we ended the quarter with 14.7 million of working capital. And I think of that is about 19.7 million of cash. So just going through our dividend history, we have been paying dividends since the third quarter of 2021. Um, we paid every quarter at, at these varying amounts. Um, this is just part of our longstanding um, balance stakeholder return and reinvestment model. Um, so to date, we've paid over we paid a dollar twenty two US um, per share in dividends, um, and that has amounted to just under forty four million um, US dollars. Uh, the Q2 dividend, we announced that in June, it was paid um, paid already in July. It was consistent with our Q1 dividend of $0.09 cents, uh, per share, and, and that was reduced relative to 2023 just with the lower um, production volumes we've seen to date, or seen up to the end of Q2 anyway, um, and then lower cash flows. But overall, that's a dividend yield of just over 10% at these current prices. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Allison. So, yes, um, this um, balanced capital allocation model that we talked about, this is something we introduced quite some time ago. Um, uh, the model is to basically <clears throat> take half of our cash flows and reinvest that in organic growth and take the other half and return it to stakeholders. So if you look at the chart on the left hand side, this is uh, since we came on production all the different funds flow that we've generated by quarter are the black dots and the green line that you see here most recently, the $7.9 million of funds flow that Allison referred to. And then each of the stacking, so that, that's the cash inflows per quarter, and then all the stacking bars are the cash outflows on a quarterly basis uh, <clears throat> broken down by type. So you can see early on, virtually all the cash either went to building cash and working capital and or uh, repaying on an accelerated basis our, our um, initial credit facility that we had, which is in the, the green cross hatching that you see here. Uh, we did do a share buyback um, in the third quarter of 2021, and then we also introduced the dividend, as Allison mentioned, at that time. So those are the solid green bars. And then more recently, you've seen, um, you know, initially, we because we had pre-funded all of our cabaret project, we didn't really have to be investing a lot of capital uh, near the beginning. You have seen more of that uh, recently, uh, and you'll see us ramp that up a, a little bit here in the second half of this year as well. Um, if you look at it in total since July, uh, so this is now... Um, uh, uh, from the July 5th, 2020, all the way through to the end of the second quarter of 2024, you can see we've spent, uh, of the, the $147 million of cash flow or funds flow from operations that we've generated, 43% of that's went to capital expenditures. 9% of it's, uh, gone towards building that cash and working capital position that Allison referred to. And then, um, around 48% of it's went out to stakeholders. Um, we did announce yesterday uh, a plan to complement our stakeholder return uh, portion of the pie here with uh, a share purchase uh, repurchase program. Um, and our intent is to basically 
take any excess, if we take a fund sold from operations, multiply that by 50% and then deduct off our, our dividends and our capital lease payments. And if there's an excess amount there, our intent is to allocate that to share repurchases. So if you do that for the first half of this year, uh, we have excess uh, available cash flow from that of uh, half a million dollars. That's the initial allocation. And our expectation is that we can grow that uh, based on results moving forward over the over the, the, the coming year here. I'll just uh, update you guys on the uh, our organic growth plan here. So just a reminder, we have an existing uh, midstream infrastructure to sell up to 18 million standard cubic feet of gas with our existing transfer pipeline, our existing uh, UPGN, our gas processing facility, and the connection to the local gas distribution company, which is Bahia Gas. As Corey mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, we had uh, positive redetermined redetermination results, uh, increasing our working interest production from this cabaret or unit, uh, in increasing our production entitlement from 49% to 56.2% of the production capacity of that field. Um, currently this year, we're going through the uh, capital development program at the unit or cabaret with additional wells and uh, 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 unit compression or field compression at that facility. And that will uh, enable us to continue our production levels to by gas from the uh, from the asset here. Um, the other main asset that we're focused on here in 2024 is our Merca 2 So that's our 100% working interest uh, asset just north of uh, Cabaret. Uh, we've got the existing infrastructure uh, built to produce up to 7 million standard cubic feet of gas uh, to, to sales from that, uh, from that asset with the transfer pipeline and a, uh, and a hub or central process processing facility at the, uh, at the 183 one uh, location. The, uh, that location also has the 183 A3 well bore and currently we're going through recompletion operations at that, at that location to recomplete the Kurasu zones in both the 183.1 and the 183.83 A3 well bores. And that work is currently ongoing. Uh, the benefit of that is both those wells are currently tied into our infrastructure. So as soon as we're done the, uh, the completion operations, they'll be immediately put onto production and sales. Um, and we expect to see the results of these capital investments uh, in the, the next quarter here. Um, following this, you know, we have a multi-year development opportunity in, in Merck 2-2 with, with existing uh, locations constructed for follow-up wells pending on the, uh, on the work we're doing here in this quarter. And as highlighted in the reserve, both reserve and the contingent perspective resource report, we have a lot of, of growth um, and running room for the Merck 2-2 asset. So lots to look forward to there. All right. Thank you, Adrian. So just in summary, um, I do strongly uh, still believe that Alvo Petra offers an attractive investment proposition, no matter what your uh, focus is. Uh, I think you can see from the results, they speak for themselves. Um, you know, we benefit from very attractive gas prices, industry leading operating net backs. We've got a clean balance sheet and, and very strong free cash flow generation capacity and all that together helps support our balanced stakeholder return model. For value investors, we're trading at about a third of our 2P NAV. For yield investors, um, our, our dividend uh, translates into over a 10% dividend yield at current prices with, with dividends paid quarterly in U.S. dollars. And then for growth investors, uh, you know, we've got an exciting organically funded capital program and, and certainly a, a significant amount of potential when you compare it to our existing market cap or enterprise value. And we've got, I think, some exciting results coming out over the next literally 30 days here. So with that, we'll turn it over to the question and answer uh, period. And I'll just uh, quickly stop sharing the screen. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a few questions that have come in both um, through Zoom and on social media. Um, for the gas price for July and for the rest of the year, for the volumes that are sold incremental to the firm volumes under the con contract, what gas price do you expect to achieve? And how much price-sensitive demand are you seeing from Bahia Gas? 
Uh, well, you know, that, that's the whole reason why, you know, we went through a phase where, you know, some of the, the demand impacts that Bahia Gas were seeing were temporary, and then it became clear that some of them were actually more permanent. So that was kind of an evolution. Um, and, uh, you know, I think some of the market is responding to that similarly to how we are responding. Um, but overall, you know, the, the price adjustments we're talking about aren't overly material, but the production increase that we have seen is quite material. So, um, you know, we'll continue to review the situation monthly. Uh, I think more importantly, um, we talked about this before, but basically what happened was Bahia Gas projected a demand forecast out for two years and filled up their their uh, gas supply as well as their transportation commitments for basically all of 2023 and 2024. So as we exit 2024, our expectation is that Bahia Gas is going to adjust their overall portfolio so that it uh, it, it recalibrates things down to the, this new uh, uh, demand reality. And as a result, we wouldn't see uh, the type of fluctuation that we, we'd seen in the past. Where is production capacity at at the moment, and when do you expect to reach the near term goal, near term goal of 18 million cubic feet a day? Yeah, the production capacity I would say is limited by our UPGN, which is roughly 18 million cubic cubic feet a day, or 500 E3 M3 a day. Uh, so we can uh, easily sell up to that uh, if we have the productive capacity at the fields. And, you know, part of our capital program in, right now is to increase the, the rates from Merck to two, so we try and achieve that goal. So, Yeah, it's a little bit of a function of the, the, the amount of production that we're taking from the unit as well as the results on this upcoming activity. So I think we'll be uh, in a in a better position to answer that in in a in a month's time, hopefully. So we do still we do have a few questions on Merck two two. Um, is the aim still to reach over five million cubic feet a day from Merck two two in twenty twenty five? Yeah. So our sorry, Adrian. I'll just so the plan really is to take what we're doing with these recompletions and then apply the learnings from that to our capital program going forward. So uh, we want to get those results in and then position ourselves to start executing our long-term development program. So um, certainly directionally, we think that asset can still deliver on our longer-term uh, objectives. Um, you know, the timing of that may shift a, a little bit based on when we start the drilling program. But I think we're really well positioned because we've got three drilling pads to, to drill multiple development wells from that are all pipeline connected. So we're uniquely positioned to quickly convert natural gas drilling successes into, into production and cash flow. And then as we develop that resource in the southern portion of our America 2 project, we can get out in front of that and start to build with well pads and 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 additional field pipelines to to connect back to our our 183.1 facility, uh, which has an initial capacity, but it, it uh, as as Adrian mentioned, of about seven million cubic feet a day. But based on results, that can be easily expanded. So there was a follow up question to that. You've already answered most of it, but around the timing of drilling the new wells on Merck 2.2. And the expected capex in the second half of this year in 2025. I think you've already answered that the new wells are dependent on the results of this program that we're undertaking right now, as will be the, the capex for that would be dependent on that as well and the timing for that. Um, for the second half of this year, the recompletions that we have um, planned here on 183.1 and 183A3. Um, that's at an estimated cost of roughly $3 million, and that should mostly be in the third quarter. So just to round out that question. Um, another question on Merck 2.2, how are you developing and are you permitted to frack? Yes, so, <laughs> yeah, we're in the... Uh... We're in the phase of actually getting a development permit for um, uh, for the, the field license. Um, there's a natural transition period out of the exploration phase and, and into the development phase. Um, and our expectation and, and plan will be to, to, to use stimulation technology. Uh, at least that's our current plan as we develop the field. If the results of 
the three existing wells and the and the programs we have planned there um, on Merck 22 are meaningful. Will Elvo Petro do a reserve update? Well, I can I can answer. No, this. Yeah, I, I think practically speaking, you know, by the time we get we'll get some initial results here. Hopefully by the end of August, um, you know, we'll. Want to, we'll see a couple months of that. We'll be pretty close to our normal reserve update season anyway. Um, so my guess is we would probably wait, but yeah, exactly. Um, okay, a little bit more on the production side. Thoughts on why there was a jump in sales in July, and is it a trend? Um, any specific reason why Bahia Gas nominated more? Yeah, I touched on this through the presentation. It's it's pretty much entirely due to you know reviewing our flexible pricing um, on on a monthly basis. Uh, we did the same for August. We expect production to be similar in August, um, and our our hope is or expectation is that uh, we can continue that through the rest of this year. And then with the annual co contract renewal, you know we're evaluating um, you know new firm production levels that, that will help secure at least a, a, a nice higher base of, of production and then complement that as we add Merca 2.2 production um, over the next 18 months. And are you providing specific production, ex specific production guidance for the second half of 2024? Can we expect it to remain at July levels? Well, again, it, it, so we're kind of unique in that our production guidance is, is mostly a, a result of, of what's happening with our off taker Bahia gas. So, you know, our current expectation is to, is to stay at similar levels. Um, but no, we don't typically provide quarterly production guidance. Um, there's another question. Where are you focusing your development program? Yeah, I can comment on that. As I noted on the organic growth slide earlier, you know, we've got a, a development program at the unit where we're drilling five wells. Uh, I think I mentioned we're going to start to drill those in Q4 of this year, and it's going to go into 2025. We're developing um, that field with field compression that will be installed and commissioned in the fourth quarter. Uh, so that's one chunk of our development program. And then the other aspect is is Merc 2.2, which we've been talking about, where we're focusing our efforts on these recompletions that we're doing right now, putting those wells online and taking the uh, recompletion learnings that we're doing that to uh, incorporate into the future development and drilling programs in 20, uh, 2025. Um, just moving to some corporate questions. How long do you expect the ICC full review to take? Uh, yeah, these are hard questions to answer because every every process is different. But I think this is uh, sufficiently complex. Our the based on the advice that we're getting is it, it's it's a uh, it's potentially a multi year process. Um, on the NCIB, there's a question um, if we expect to actually use the NCIB this time, um, especially to reward long longer time shareholders, long term shareholders. Yes, our intention is to uh, be using this. Um, we expect to get approvals hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, and we put set an initial budget and, and, you know, our expectation if we can certainly continue the results that uh, production levels uh, like we've seen in July would generate, I think we'll certainly be able to, to complement that, uh, the budget related to share repurchases moving forward. Um, will there be a priority to continue to grow the dividend where it was prior to the cut? Can we expect consistent annual dividend growth as earnings grow? Yeah, no, that's a good question. It's something that we talk about at the board level every quarter. Um, I think, you know, I would say, and obviously this is subject to, to the board decision every quarter, but as certainly in the near term, the plan is to, you know, take the excess above that base dividend and allocate it to share repurchases. Um, and then based on results, we'll evaluate that mix between additional dividends or additional share repurchases on, on a on really on a quarterly basis. And we have no further questions at this time.
All right. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining again today. We look forward to updating you um, over the, the next month and certainly uh, see you again on the, on the next quarterly call. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us and, and uh, thank you for all the support. Thanks, everyone.